moving water, one of Earth's greatest natural sources of power. Early settlers of Dartmouth were quick to recognize the potential of the town's many streams and rivers, so that it should come as no surprise that by the mid-1660s, dams began to be built and mills of one sort or another constructed to take advantage of this free power source. Where were these early mills in Dartmouth? Let's begin at the north end of town and follow the natural flow of streams and rivers southward to the sea. The red marks on this map will give you a basic idea of early mill site towns. Later, we'll visit a number of these places. There may very well be more locations, which, however, have been lost to time over the years. The vast majority of these sites supported either grist mills, sawmills, shingle mills, or pulling mills. It is said that the Romans developed the grinding of grains with circular milling stones. However, we know that grains have been ground up by some method or another since prehistoric times. Here in America, long before the coming of Europeans to this area, Wampanoag women spent countless hours grinding corn using a stone or wooden mortar and pestle to make flour for their family's use. This was a long and laborious process. Later, some early European settlers used a device called a quern to grind grain at home. A quern is made up of two stones. The bottom one is stationary, and the top one is turned by hand with a handle. Kernels of grain are poured into a hole in the middle of the top stone, which, when turned, crushes the grain between the two stones and pushes it out to the side to be gathered up. This was still both a long and laborious process by hand. As the population in towns increased, folks got together and began to build water-powered mills to take over the bulk of such strenuous handwork, such as grinding grain or sawing lumber, as well as other hard tasks. By 1630, there were already many such mills in Massachusetts. When building any kind of a water-powered mill, the first thing folks looked for was a good location. This could be a swift, shallow river or natural waterfall. Once the site was selected, a mill dam was built to control the water flow. When completed, the dam soon caused the stream behind it to spread out and form a mill pond which not only powered the mill, but became home to fish, turtles, and waterfowl, and in the winter was a convenient skating pond for all to enjoy. Depending on circumstances, the early mill builders had three possible choices for the kind of water wheel they wanted to turn their machinery. Probably the most efficient type of wheel was the overshot wheel. Water spilled onto the top of the wheel from a sluiceway. This was a kind of trough for channeling water. The paddles, or buckets, on the wheel began to fill and in so doing turned the wheel around. As a general rule, the more paddles a wheel had, the more energy was created. A second type of wheel was called a breast wheel. It received its water flow from near the center of the wheel, near the axle. A breast wheel could be nearly as efficient as an overshot wheel if its paddles were close together. The last wheel type is known as an undershot wheel. These water wheels were often placed in running streams without benefit of a dam. They were certainly the least efficient of the three, but proved to be less expensive to build, and in some circumstances, more practical. They always received the water flow directly at the bottom of the wheel. Later on, a new, smaller, and more efficient water turbine was developed. One such was the Tyler flume wheel shown here. Some of Dartmouth's mills converted to these turbines in the later 1800s and used them until the advent of the internal combustion engine or until they ceased operation. Well now, how about the farmers that grew the grain both in Dartmouth and elsewhere? 
In the early days, a farmer hitched up his oxen, or perhaps horses, to the plow once spring arrived and spent hours, even days at a time, preparing his fields for seed. As summer wore on and the grains ripened, the job of harvesting took over. Farmers sharpened both reaping hooks, also called sickles, and their scythes, some with cradles attached. It was hard work cutting crops by hand, but sometimes nearby farmers helped each other gather in the grain, as we can see here. It wasn't until 1831 when Cyrus McCormick developed the first mechanical reaper down in Virginia that the chore of harvesting eased up a bit, at least for those working the fields. Once the grain was cut and gathered in, the farmers had to use a flail to separate the grain from the straw. You can see the process here in this old woodcut. The flail is made up of two wooden rods attached at the end with leather ties. When the farmer beats the cut grain, the kernels separate from the straw. This is called threshing. The last part of the farmer's job was to separate the kernels from the husk. To do this, he tossed the grain up into the air with a winnowing basket, which caused the husk to fly away in the wind. This process was called winnowing. He then could take his grain to the mill at his convenience. Well, getting to the mill was not always as easy a task as one might expect. Roads in general were not very good. Some, early on, were no better than mere footpaths. An ambitious farmer might carry a sack of grain to the mill or use a horse to help, if indeed he had one. Many farmers waited until the snow fell, however, for a horse and sleigh gave a smoother ride over bad roads or open terrain. Let's take a brief look now inside a typical grist mill. Most in town were small and very plain inside. Here on the left is the hopper and covered millstones with a large crane alongside for lifting the millstones when necessary. The miller is weighing flour and bagging it for sale. Somewhere in the building is a catch whose job it is to help keep out uninvited guests. Here one can see both the gearing that turns the millstone, its connection to the overshot water wheel, and the placement of the millstones themselves. Only the top stone, called the runner, turns. It has grooves in its bottom surface. The bottom stone, or bed stone, is stationary and has grooves cut in the top surface. These grooves are important while they serve as channels for air, carry off heat from friction while grinding, and act as a pathway for ground flour to find its way to the edge. The two stones do not actually touch, but can be adjusted slightly to accommodate different grains to be ground. A few times a month, on average, the miller has to dress his millstones. This meant that he had to pick and trim the furrows on each millstone to keep them sort of roughed up. This made for a finer ground flour. Now that we have an idea of how water-powered mills work, let's visit some of their sites around town. What kinds of mills were most numerous in Dartmouth over the years? Probably, one would have to say grist mills, sawmills, and shingle mills. But there also were a few others, like pulling mills to process wool, an oil mill, bark mill, carding mill, and cotton mill. In addition, there were two wind-powered salt works in Peyton Aram, and an ice house on the New Bedford border at Furnace Pond. Just about all of the mill sites, save one, can best be deemed archaeological sites for as we'll see, not much evidence remains of their existence. Many, also, are on private property. The vast majority of Dartmouth's water-powered mills date from the early to late 1700s. Let's start up in the north end of town and visit a site off Collins Corner Road, the remains of the D. Collins Sawmill. This area, now under the control of the Dartmouth Natural Resources Trust, boasts a fine original roadway on top of a dam, as well as still visible ruins of the mill's foundation. 
Even today, water continues to flow through this site. In the Collins Lane area off North Hicksville Road, on the property of the Rod and Gun Club of New Bedford, are some mill sites dating to the mid-18th century. At the north end of the property, along the upper Copacut River, is the Andrews Shingle Mill Foundation, with a very long mill race still channeling water to the mill. Closer to Collins Lane itself was a grist mill and sawmill. The Mill Pond Dam and complex water holding system areas are still visible here, as well as parts of one of the millstones. A photo of the sawmill also has survived, thanks to the Collins family who once lived on this site. Just east of Hicksville Village, on the north side of the Old Fall River Road, is Collins Pond. This is the site of Wilbur's Grist and Shingle Mill, which dates from the early 1700s. No real evidence of the mill has survived here, except for the mill dam itself, and even that has been modernized. However, this area now boasts a pleasant small park for folks to enjoy, thanks to both the gun club and town park department. Continuing east on the Old Fall River Road, which, by the way, was then known as Prospect Hill Road, we come to the Dartmouth-New Bedford border at Turner's Pond. Here, indeed, is a most interesting site. Adjacent to the town line, on the south side of the road, is the impressive foundation of Turner's Saw and Grist Mill. It can best be viewed along the Sarabee Perth Nature Trail. Next to the pond, on the New Bedford side of the town line, is the site of an ice house, which made good use of the frozen pond water during the cold winter months, as one can see from this view of cutting ice in the early years of the 20th century. Though many of Dartmouth's mills were situated in rural areas, some, such as those at Smith Mills and Russell's Mills, grew up into village communities. At Smith Mills, there were a number of mills which offered either pulling, grinding, cotton, sawing, or grist services. There were also stores, homes, a tavern, school, blacksmith, churches, and more. Smith Mills has remained a hub of activity for centuries and continues as such to the present. However, what early mill evidence now remains? Evidence of the several mill locations at Smith Mills is unfortunately almost non-existent. The best one can do today is to visit the small park on the north side of the state road, just before the turn onto Fonts Corner Road. Here can be found the mill dam, spillway, and mill race, as well as evidence of one of the mill's foundations on the property. A good time to visit the Smith Mills Historic Park is in the autumn, when one can both walk the ground to learn its history, as well as take in the fine colors of the season. Russell's Mills, without a doubt the best preserved of Dartmouth's early villages, came into being in 1704, when the Russell family began mill construction in the area. The result was some 11 mills over time. Today, the village remains a busy area, for roads to different parts of town still radiate from the center of the place. But now, what about the mills? Is anything still left for one to see? Perhaps the best place to begin is on Rockadundy Road, just down the hill from the village center. Here is found a fine mill pond and waterfall. At one time, there were four mills in this area, one situated upstream, and all powered by the waters of the Pascomancet River and mill pond. There were also two dams. Here we see a watercolor of Russell's and later Cummings Mill in better days. The south side was a grist mill and north side a pulling mill for processing wool. By the late 1800s, the mill fell on hard times, as one can see here, and now no real evidence of the structures exist. Just downstream, a short distance near the landing on Horseneck Road, is the site of Deacon Macomber's grist mill, dating back to 1710. 
It was situated at the mouth of Destruction Brook. The area now is very much overgrown, as one can see. Of all the mill sites in the entire town of Dartmouth, the best preserved is Allen's Mill on Slade's Corner Road near Russell's Mills. Fed by the waters of Destruction Brook, this combination grist and sawmill has been in operation in some form or other from 1690 to the 1950s. It then fell on hard times and began to decay. In fact, the attached sawmill had already been destroyed in a fire back in 1940. In addition, the mill race became increasingly choked with debris. Let's take a tour now of the original mill building before demolition and reconstruction. Here we see the main floor of the mill with lumber and debris scattered around. Above the doorway is an interesting old ad for the Bowery Boys. There must surely be a story about this print somewhere in the mill's history. Here is the upper level of the interior. The millstones by now are gone, and the roof has begun to open up. Here is some of the gearing still in rather good condition. Huge timbers here can be seen holding up the upper floor as well as securing more of the gearing. An interesting way to build a chimney. During the year 2003, what remained of the original mill was carefully taken apart. Interior beams, husk frame, and machinery were covered with a temporary housing as a safeguard against the approaching winter. With the coming of early spring in 2004, the protective shelter was removed so construction of the post and beam mill could begin. Framework for the sides of the mill was assembled on the ground and then hoisted into position with a crane. Once the sides were secure, framing for the roof was hammered into position. The next step was putting up the siding on the mill. Well, I guess this door will work just fine. Next comes the windows and a finished shingled roof. Well, the main part of the mill is just about done. Later, the wagon loading dock is planned as well as reconstruction of the attached sawmill. A very pleasant surprise in 2004 was the donation of two original millstones from the mill. These had been in private hands for some time. With the advent of winter and many snows that followed, Allen's Mill took on a Christmas card-like personality reminiscent of earlier times. Leaving Allen's Mill, which is an ongoing project. We come to the head of the river near Tadenarum. There was one grist mill in this area 
close to the corner of Russell's Mills Road and Elm Street. Dating from around 1780, it was owned by John Waity and faced right on Elm Street. In fact, here's a closer view of the mill and three small curious boys looking over the fencing along Elm Street to the tail race below. Today, there isn't much left to see, for the mill is long gone now. The mill pond, which is on private property, survives as well as the waterway that powered the mill. Indeed, the tail race under Elm Street remains, but now largely for the local mallard ducks to enjoy. Before leaving the south end of Dartmouth, mention must be made of the use of wind rather than water for power. Windmills were used for powering a grist mill or sawmill, and some existed in the Dartmouth area for that purpose. Wind as a power source was also used at the two major salt works in the Paid Merrim area. In this view of the salt works at Rickerson's Point, several small windmills can be seen. They were used to pump seawater into the drying vats. A closer look shows how simple these windmills were, as well as offering a close look at the covered drying vats for the pumped in seawater. And so, now we have it. One can certainly see that the town of Dartmouth has both an early and rich industrial history, a history well worth both preserving and promoting. And remember, this presentation just touched on some of what this town had. Certainly, much more history lies buried in dense, overgrown areas now long forgotten. The poet, Mildred L. Jarrell, rather sums it up nicely in her poem called The Mill Stream. The grand old mill is darkened now. Still the mill stream wanders by, caressing the banks and the water wheel with a whisper and a sigh. Time was when the wheel sang its merry song and the water gushed and sped sending up crystal drops of spray as it raced o'er its rocky bed. Wood ivy and creeper are tangled now, hanging over the old mill door. The creak of the wheel and grinding stones are stilled forevermore. And still the mill stream murmurs on, soft sounds for the mill to hear, reminiscing of times long past, memories of yesteryear. Thank you.